I'm Ronnie Lou, Life Coach, Ronnie Loiza, and I'm a guest on the Online Prosperity Show with Prosper. And we talked about habits, your habitual way of thinking, and fun, celebrative accountability. I do mostly thought work. That's my process. Thought work to get you to level up by taking action. And you do that with your habits and your habitual way of thinking. Again, I'm Ronnie Lowe, Life Coach, and this is the Online Prosperity Show. Now, welcome to the Online Prosperity Show, and I'm your host, Prosper Tarovinga. And in this episode, I have a very special guest. Ronnie, how are you doing today? I am doing wonderfully. Thank you so much. I love Australia, by the way. Absolutely. You should come visit. And uh, definitely we have space for you. But you know something about Australia, Roni? Apparently, well, I... apparently I... everything around here is designed to kill you. All the dangerous animals live here. So <laughs> fantastic. Well, I digress. Now, Roni Liza is a level up take action life coach who specializes in helping clients make bold lasting changes and whether it's transforming careers achieving uh promotions at work or enhancing their own marriages or even improving their own physical fitness Ronnie's clients are ready to take action and level up their lives and with her unique methodology that she calls thought work coaching which we're going to be talking uh predominantly about in this show today she guides individuals in creating productive habits and provides them with accountability that they actually need to succeed now I want you to join our us as we explore, um, you know, Ronnie's expertise and um, methods in habit creation, thought transformation, and the importance of fitness in achieving prosperity. Now, Ronnie, tell us a little bit about how you actually got started and how you got into this uh, realm of uh, life coaching. Well, what you just said sounds like a lot, like a big pot of stew. So I'll I'll sip it out a little bit. The reason it sounds like a lot is because I am a certified professional life coach. Ooh, my camera's shaking. And um, I am in California, but it wasn't an earthquake. Um, really, I came from the realm of fitness. And before fitness, I was in public relations and media training. So evolved out of fitness, out of the COVID closures, I couldn't go to my personal clients anymore um, because all the gyms closed, the studio boutiques closed, and I couldn't go to their homes anymore. Um, so uh, put up the camera. I'm like, I'm not an Instagram kind of girl, but okay. We went on Zoom and I realized I was laser focusing on them and it worked. Um, but then at the time, and you know, Prosper, Prosper, um, People were going through anxious times. As much as we pulled our big boy pants up, as much as we pulled our big girl pants up, as I say, at the time, we were afraid, business people were afraid, whether they were the boss or an employee or an entrepreneur, they were afraid of not being indispensable. They were afraid of being dispensable. So people were online all the time emails till nine at night. The kids were at home. Everybody was working off the dining room table. So some of my clients were talking to me about, you know, my sister, or, you know, my friend or whoever. Fitness was the first thing to drop off that calendar. They were not taking care of themselves. And so I would offer, well, do you want me to talk to them? Because as a certified personal trainer, I, I still am the type of person that if I'm interested in something, I research it. I research it, and then I go ahead and go to school for it and get an accreditation or something. So I had studied a lot of behavior modification, behavior change, sports performance, all of that. Mostly in personal training, 90% of it. Yes, you have to do it, but having to do it always came first from the mindset. So I would offer, do you want me to talk to them? And people started telling me, you know, can I talk to you again? Can I talk to you again? And somebody said, God, you really coached me through that. This was an executive, a C-suite executive. And I'm like, how did I coach you? I guess so. And other people were telling me, you should start thinking about becoming a life coach. At the time, Prosper, I was like, what's a life coach? You know, I thought it was some kind of woo-woo thing. I mean, I thought of sports coach, executive coach, all that. When I looked it up, it was at least 32 different kinds of coaches. So I finally took it seriously. I'm like, you know, I'm going to look into it. And I went to school, still going to school, leveling up in all leveling up, going up in the levels, as we call it. So I'm, I got certified 
And I took it seriously for me. I wanted to get that certification, go through the curriculum and learn my stuff. And you have to go through practice and practice and practice of hours. Fast forward to today, I have evolved through being a fitness coach, a wellness coach. I'm in my 50s. I was even a midlife women's wellness coach. I was trying to find like, get out of that, what do they call it? The imposter syndrome? Like, can I, do I really have to be a medical doctor to be a wellness coach? Or do I have to really know how, uh, an executive coach or certification? It's like, no, you really have to coach. <laughs> it's the practice. It's like being in med school. It's, you got to go out there and start practicing on patients. So a good year of practice and getting real clients and working with them, I've really honed in on what is the one thing I finally started surveying and taking testimonials from my clients, what's really working for them. And the same words keep coming up, habits, or as I call it also, habitual way of thinking. We have a habitual way of thinking. We have a default program, each one of us, and accountability. That's my strong point. But I, I make it fun, celebrative accountability. And I would love uh, to talk about that with you. But in that, my process is thought work. It all starts with the mind. Like I said, every behavior, every reaction, every inaction, everything comes from an emotion. As put together and logical as you are, you still have an emotion. I don't care if you're programming software. There's an emotion. You know, somebody programming like happy or focused. Okay. I'm not joyous, but they're not in despair. They're not in fear. Sometimes they can be in doubt, whatever. It can be a scientist. It can be whoever is working on something. You have an emotion. So all our actions, all our behavior, they all come from an emotion and the emotion is always prompted by a thought. That's how our brain works. Our computer works that way. So in my thought work, we really go back to how are you feeling? And it's interesting, Prosper, people always go in when I ask them, ask them about something because coaches, you know, we take the client into self-exploration and asking your own questions and finding your own possibilities and your own answers and your own possibilities. We're not like consultants, so to speak, in that we don't assess something and give you um, a solicited suggestion, opinion, or answer. We don't give you our opinion. We get you to work on what's your opinion. So in working with people, I always think, well, what did you think of this? Or what did you think of that? And people always say, well, I felt like, or I thought, and they're not really giving me an emotion. They're giving me, no, they say, I feel like I, blah, 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 blah. An example. It's like, did you really feel that or was that a thought? So I always take my client back to, was that a factual 100% absolute flat, uh, thought? Can you prove it in a court of law? You know, they laugh. It's like, it's not a fact. It's just an opinion. It's a perception. And it's not even a feeling. It was a thought. People always say feeling, especially women. We say, I felt like, I feel like. Did you really feel? What, what was the emotion behind that feeling? That wasn't a feeling. That was a thought. So that that's my proprietary thought work, which I call it. We always take it back to the basic. What was the thought that prompted that emotion? And then we look for the actual fact that fits. Do you want to cut me off here or kind of ask some questions? Do you know what oh, I'm talking about? Am I being clear? <laughs> I'm enjoying this because obviously you really are coming from a space of deep set knowledge of your uh, modality here. And it's very interesting for us to really get an in-depth understanding of, um, you know, what you are doing to help other people. But coming back just a little bit to when you started answering the question, you did um, you know, mentioned the fact that during the pandemic, a lot of people felt indispensable within their jobs. I mean, obviously, they no, were actually they felt dispensable. dispensable. They were afraid of, yeah, right. They felt dispensable, and I can only imagine because if you're being told that what you've been doing all your life, you're no longer essential to the next, um, you know, economy, or you're no longer needed. You know, it mm. does really take, um, you know, it's toll on people mentally. And now you say people were now like, neglecting themselves physically. I viscerally believe you can't do well if you don't feel well. So just touch up on how does fitness maybe contribute to personal and professional success and what are the benefits of incorporating um you know wellness sort of coaching in in business and in companies this is a really good question because what i have found is when people come to me i have had 
many clients come to me for career growth. How did I get promoted at my job, leadership, all of this. And it's funny how we always go back to touching every aspect of your life. Very holistic, mind, body, psyche, or mind, body, soul, or mind, body, spirit. We are made up of all three. Whatever you want to call the spirituality or psyche, then we also have our body to take care of, our physical, biological, anatomical body. And then we also have, you know, the mind, the body, and the spirit, the mind, the, body, the emotions. Okay. So when people have come to me for a career transition or career growth, we always end up hitting the self care. And it's not like getting manicures and massages. Self-care is anything you do to literally take care of every aspect of your life. So let's say eating, for example. If you're not eating well, or you're not exercising enough, or you're not at least moving, if you're not in a healthy disposition and a state of being, you're not at your prime to perform the best in your job, at your work, or in a relationship or with your family to be fully present or be fully present with yourself. It affects every aspect of your life. So that doesn't mean that, oh, we put you on a diet, a nutrition, this nutritional plan. We look at what's going on with you. I had, I'll give you an example. I had this one lady who wanted to totally leave this, this job she'd been doing for at least 13 years. And every year she told herself this year and one year adds up to another. She never left it. She heard, she heard me on some webinar and she got a hold of me. She's like, I want to do it. I want to, I want to launch. I want to take action. So we've been working on this along the way. We found out that she just wasn't getting enough sleep and that she was overweight. And how does this affect everything? Well, you can't even start being in the right frame of mind. If you're too, too tired to start taking that leap. It also starts etching, you know, it was edging into her confidence. You know, she was just every day going to the same job. Um, so we started looking at that. She ended up going to the doctor, which she hadn't been to in years, found out that she was pre-diabetic, had visceral fat in her organs. She had to take care of a lot of things she didn't know about, you know, denial. She has started taking care of herself, calling that doctor, first of all, started just moving just five minutes in the morning, the habits, started looking into her schedule when she could move, when she could do a little calisthenics, when she could go for a walk. We started changing her habitual way of thinking of, I'm, I'm really hungry. She wasn't hungry. She was tired, lethargic. Often people, when, when they're tired, they think they're hungry. But really, it's because you lack a hormone. And I won't go there in all the minutia, but it's because you lack a certain hormone that you didn't get or you didn't produce enough when you didn't get enough sleep. So your mind during the day thinks, I need sugar, I need glucose. I No, you really needed to sleep. You need to get enough actual rest. Often you're thirsty, but you think you're hungry. So we started working with her eating habits. Not only did she leave her job finally after so many years, she's now going after a dream. She wants to be an event planner. She's coming from this data input thing with insurance, going into event planning for weddings and parties and fundraisers. I mean, something she was really afraid to do. She wanted to be an entrepreneur, but her health really played a part in that. Absolutely. To answer your question, that's just one thing. But I, I work with many entrepreneurs and I work with many people in C-suite level who, and the highest performers, it's interesting, when I was doing some research years ago as a personal trainer, the highest achievers in business and companies, and when we talk achievers, you prosper, you and I know we mean dollars, okay? The highest achievers, always worked out and exercised and took care of themselves. I thought that was really interesting. Absolutely. And I, I really gravitated to the story of this lady who now went on to, you know, pursue a dream career while she was being stuck in the data entry, you know, side of things that you're mentioning, because how you do anything is how you do everything. The way she was uh, eating also manifested in the way that she showed up at work. And obviously, you know, wh whatever you do, um, you know, now sort of comes around the habits and the rituals that you do in order to achieve that optimum sort of health. And you keep referring back to this habitual um, way of thinking. And I think it was Einstein that mentioned uh, the thinking that got us here is not the thinking that will take us to the next level or it's insanity. I mean, um, in insanity is thinking that, you know, doing the same things will give us a, a different result. So 
my question to you now is what are the key principles behind creating and maintaining habits that now become natural and unforced in order for us to be, do, and have a happier existence? Well, that's just it. A habit by its very definition is natural because it is a habit. It, it's not like it's not forced. You don't have to force yourself to do it and motivate yourself to do it. You don't motivate to do something you do every day without thinking much of it. You know, you don't motivate yourself to, oh my God, I have to tie this shoe. How do I do it? You don't have to motivate yourself to zip up your jacket. Your body just knows how to do it. So it's not, no second thought. Everybody always uses the same brush your teeth. You weren't born out of your mom's womb knowing how to do all these habits. You were taught, you were conditioned. And then you condition yourselves. We all condition ourselves in a way of thinking. Now, that can be from our family, our culture, our religion, our gender, whatever it is, all this plays a part. But we do condition this, the mind. So our habitual way of thinking, we can reprogram it, not overnight. So we have to create new habits. We have to catch ourselves in whatever it is we're thinking or how we're, we're feeling Catch that emotion. Okay, what's the thought behind that? And then really work and put in a thought that's real. I'll give you the, the quickest example. For, um, I was working with a client. I'm sure I can, I can say those. Who thought, I need new business. I need new business. I have no new business. So she was feeling like crap. <laughs> you know, she was really, it's so her feeling was, is it joy? Is it fear? Is it despair? Is it anger? Is it a mix of all that? So she thought it's a bit of anger, but it's mostly, it's not despair, but it is fear. Okay. So you need new business. Why do you need new business? So we had to go back there and we really uncovered things. She started uncovering the things she did. She's okay financially, but her mind was, I have to get new business. I have to get new business. She doesn't need to. She's okay. She wants more in order to be more secure and get a new home. But it's not like she's in despair. But the, let's go back to the thought. She's okay. She's secure, but she wants to grow it or she won't feel successful. So I, she, I asked her, how many clients do you have in your new business? She's like, I have no clients. I'm like, Really? I said, well, and then she was telling me how she was taking care of one pro bono and another one, which is more of a pro bono. And then one, and I'm like, so you have three clients, you're actually doing something for them. And are they, we, you know, fast forward, they were benefiting from it. And she's proving to herself that she can get into this new business because she's actually helping them and what they want. So I said, does that sound like a client? You didn't say paying client. And she just started laughing. So what we found what worked for her, she changed her thought from, I have no clients to I have three introductory clients. The reason she liked introductory rather than beta, because some people use beta clients or trades or whatever. She liked introductory because that was introducing her into the new business. She thought that felt well for her. That was true for her. And it was a fact. See, the difference, Prosper, between affirmations and click your heels three times with, you know, wishful thinking affirmations. And the problem with that is, yes, you can journal, you can say affirmations, you can do all that. But if there's a little nugget in your brain that doubts it, then often these affirmations is really hope. And hope can often, as I have seen in my clients, be disguising doubt or fear. You want to hope you want to, you know, I'm, I'm going to be that billionaire Greek goddess, but you're not there yet. So your brain's still going, really? And it's looking, your brain is looking for evidence of, I don't see that we're billionaires. Your brain is trying to prove you right. It's trying to prove that doubt, right? So say something that's true confirmation instead of affirmation. If you look at the synonyms, they're the same, but really when affirmations are more of hope. So let's find an affirmation that is true, a fact and then that sits right. It even neutralizes your emotion. Sometimes it makes you feel joyous right away. And then your brain can go, okay, I believe that. Then you can start growing and optimizing and growing that strength, that belief with every little action and step toward that. And every little action, my accountability, is celebrative accountability. Every action you take, you celebrate. 
I don't care if it's small, it's one email, it's one phone call, it's one I'm going to sit down and focus, whatever that small step is toward it, instead of I've got to do this, or I can do this, or Nike, just do it. That's always in the future. How about right now? I am doing it. I don't care how small that step is, is I am, and that's a fact. So let's take it back to fitness. I had this one lady, instead of saying, I can do this, I've got to do this, I've got to lose weight. It's like, yeah, but that's in the future. You keep kicking the can down the road. How about I am curling this bicep right now? I am curling this dumbbell. It's the present tense, and your brain believes it because it's a fact. And the more the brain believes it, the more brain goes noted, capable. And so you keep strengthening your mind, your thought, your habitual way of thinking. Absolutely. And I really enjoyed the journey that you took us on with that, because with a lot of people, they take affirmations to be the bead and end all, you know, it's like a farmer waking up in the morning and sees weeds in his garden and then just says, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds without him actually taking the action of taking the weeds and plucking them out and making sure that the crop actually grows um, you know, free of weeds and things of that nature. Now, I'm supposing that is what you're talking about. And you did raise an interesting, uh, you know, subject there about accountability because, um, you know, science or some people say it does take about 21 days for a habit to actually start forming. But for that habit, <laughs> for that habit. I say 40. I know it's 21 in, in much of the research. I say 40. Okay, 40. <laughs> All right, let's take 40 from yeah. from. From, from Coach Roni here. So let's say, yes, like you say, 40 days for, um, you know, a habit to fully form. But for those 40 days, it's not like day one and day 40, you're just, you know, doing the motions. You literally have to be accountable for your brain to start actively seeing, like you're saying, the present tense of you actually having the action and the result which the brain then gets to believe. Now, can you please let us know how you handhold or help your clients, especially with the accountability aspect of your uh, business then? I'm doing it. We celebrate. Um, seriously, because when you celebrate in the positive, like that farmer with the weeds or a gardener and, oh my gosh, my crop is going to go to hell. Well, I there are weeds and you said take action. There are weeds and I'm pulling them. There are weeds and I'm taking care of it in the present moment. I'm taking care of it. So it's the present. Your brain believes it. Like instead of I can do this or I've got to get these weeds or I'm going to lose my crops. No, it's I am taking care of it. We don't know if you're going to lose your crops or not. We just know right now you're taking care of it. If that's all you can believe and that feels right for you. All right. So with the habits, that's why I have support for my clients in between our sessions, I tell them to celebrate by themselves, with themselves, with their husband, with their wife, with their kid, whoever they want to engage and share with, or say, look at yourself in the mirror and, and celebrate yourself or say it out loud, or maybe some kind of physical thing. And if you want, I always tell my clients, text me, text me, I'll celebrate with you. So when you say it out loud, not just think it, but when you do something physical or say it out loud, your brain hears it. That's the account a type of accountability. So it's celebrative accountability. It's all in the positive, not positive Pollyanna, but positive in not the negative because the brain only hears the word. I'm not going to eat. The brain hears eat. Okay. I'm not going to slip or I'm not, not, not. Let's take it out of the negative. You can't lie to yourself, say, I'm not stressed, I'm at peace, I am grounded. If you don't really believe it, it's like, I am stressed and I'm taking care of it now. Admit it. Feel that emotion. Feel the fear. Feel the anger. Feel whatever it is. That's it. Most people don't want to sit in the muck. And then sit in the muck and you survived. I am surviving this. And then do any kind of self-help, self-care thing that works for you, whether it's meditation, yoga, talk, breath work, you find what works for you, fine. But that, like you said, it's not the end-all be-all. That is not the secret sauce. The secret sauce is you actually feeling that emotion, changing your thought and accepting it and growing from there. Whatever works for you, all those are tools. So in my celebrative accountability, I do want them to report back to me, 
but in a fun way. Not I'm nagging, not you've got to check in. It's like, whoa, let me celebrate with you and celebrate yourself and engage other people if you want to. And then your body feels good. Then your brain feels good. Absolutely. And you've just maybe defined alignment without you even trying, because if your brain agrees with the actions and the results that you're getting, then that is true alignment. And you did also raise something very um, important where somebody's just thinking, oh, well, maybe I'm not built like that. Um, this is not me. It's always been like this. And I don't know if you've, you've got the same sentiment. Um, you know, in Australia, they have this method that nah, she'll be all right. Things will always work out. You know what I mean? We're in the lucky country and you know what I mean? So I think it's, it's probably there. And, um, you know, in, in any given scenario, everybody thinks that the situation is unique. It's totally different. Nobody has the same problem as they are facing. How then, as um, you know, a coach yourself there, Ronnie, do you then tailor your methodology to each individual client's um, unique needs and circumstances? Well, I say that everybody, even though we're all human beings and we're all built, we have a lot of commonality. You are as unique and the way you think is as unique as your fingerprint and no one can match your fingerprint ever. So whatever conditioning and then what you put into it is you. So yes, I get to know you. You get to know yourself and ask yourself the hard questions and you get to answer them. That's the hard part. You get to answer your own questions. And it's not like therapy where all you do is wallow and wallow in the past. And I've been through therapy and, and I, I admire therapists. I respect them. I honor them. I'm just saying the difference is, okay, we're not going to stay there. Okay. That's the reason that may be the reason. Now let's take you into the now into the present and let's go forward. So you get to go forward. Often therapy and coaching complement each other. Okay. Just like in sports, you're already on the team. You've made the team. The coach is on the sideline watching you and then brings you in afterwards to say, okay, let's look at the video replay. What do you think you did there? What were you thinking there? Okay. And often that same uh, player will go to therapy for whatever other reasons. So they can complement each other. So let's take it back to each unique person. You get to explore yourself. You get to answer the questions. You get to look at not just your skills, your strengths, but your proven capabilities. What are you capable of? When you see that you've done something, it shows, well, if I did that, then I'm capable. It's a possibility that I'm capable of doing that or feeling that or being there. So you, that opens possibilities. That gives you more ideas. So we optimize not just your skills and your talents and your strengths. We also look at your capabilities. And then we execute. We take action. I'm going more towards the habits and fun accountability coach because that's where really most of my clients are benefiting. But when I started, I would call myself the level up, take action. But level up sounds like just business. Yes. So like you said, this is in every aspect of your life. And what gets you there? What you do every day. What you do every day is your identity. You are your habits. What you do and how you think on a consistent basis are you. And it's how the world sees you. And it's what gets you your results. Absolutely. And I really appreciate that. And talking about results, um, you know, obviously it, it does seem like you're getting tremendous results, um, you know, for other people. You've given us a couple of case studies, which I think, um, you know, our valued audience has appreciated. Now, how can the person who's watching right now maybe reach out to you for maybe a complimentary consultation and they get them started on their journey towards building a life of their dreams, like um, the lady who's now an event planner who was just doing data entry that you mentioned earlier. Which is all sorts of entrepreneurs and just wh whatever you want to work in, all aspects of your life, but whatever it is that you want to work in. I have a lady who was asking me, I've got to take action, get accountability and do the steps to get a divorce. Like, whoa, <laughs> this is a new one. But the thing is, it all goes back to your way of thinking, your habitual way of thinking. So if anybody wants to get a hold of me and let's talk, let's talk. Let me get to know you. We ask each other questions. I'm at RonnieLowLifeCoach.com. 
R-O-N-N-I-E-L-O, lifecoach.com. All one word, and I'm sure you'll have it in your show notes, ronnielowlifecoach.com. We found each other, Prosper, on, on LinkedIn because um, somebody, a podcast you had, and I knew the lady, so I paid attention. Like, oh, yay. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn, and I'm also on threads now because I was on Instagram. So I'm on social media, Ronnie Lowe Life Coach. And I also work with people virtually internationally. I've had people in Denmark, in Egypt. That was quite a time zone. He was, he was coaching at two in the morning, his time. I'm like, why? I mean, I love working with you, but he's like, oh, because all my business is on and your side of the world. So I'm up. <laughs> so, yeah, I do work with people internationally. Absolutely. Absolutely. And well, thank you so much for giving us access to you in that sort of capacity. And if you're watching right now, I'll definitely have all those links um, in the show notes, but Lee, um, Ronnie, there's something that I really want to ask you before I let you go. So obviously you've reinvented yourself you'd be, from being a personal trainer to a life coach and you were once a behavior change expert, um, specialist. Now our audience and me especially will be wondering what's next? What is in the horizon for uh, Ronnie Lowe? Growing. I just want to grow and grow more. And I also want to travel with my husband. Um, the more I travel, prosper, the more I know I don't know. You know, you uh -huh. learn a lot when you travel. I just feel like, God, there's so much to learn about people and about the world. Um, so I want to travel more. Um, what's next? I'll tell you in 10 years. But I want to be doing this at least for the next 20 years of my life. I think it's fulfilling. That's just it. I finally found my purpose. And to me, purpose is... What feels fulfilling? And you can insert that into whatever you do, into your career, into your job, into your family. It's what you find fulfilling that you insert into what you're doing. I call that the dual purpose. You were put on this earth to have kids, in, in my opinion. That could be your purpose. Eh, how about how you raise your kids and what kind of parent you are is your purpose. Know what I mean? So you insert what fulfills you, who you are. And like you said, how you are in one aspect is how you are in everything else. It's true. Your purpose is your purpose. It's not just your job. It's not just your career. It is what fulfills you. And then you can insert that and share it with the world. Fantastic. I really appreciate those parting words, um, you know, that you've left with us. So thank you so much, Roni, uh, for joining us on the Online Prosperity Show today. And thank you. I have really enjoyed speaking with you. And I, I really enjoy following you as well on LinkedIn. Absolutely. Well, it has been an insightful conversation about thought work, coaching, habit creation, and the power of taking action to level up in life. And if you're ready to make bold and lasting changes and unlock your full potential, be sure to reach out to Ronnie uh, for a complimentary consultation. And I urge you to stay tuned for more episodes on the Online Prosperity Show, where we bring you expert insights in achieving prosperity in all areas of your life. Bye for now.